This in the nutshell should be in your background as we come to discuss the electron transport chain. Before I delve into the details now, I would also want to put another thing in your background where electron transport chain is going to happen. It's going to happen in, yes. Is the, the same box that the same as the catalyst? The catalyst? Not really. Sorry. Enzymes would be classified as catalysts. They will be classified as catalysts. Yes, sir. It will be a substance, I should show you, to say this is the one that we are calling. It's not going to be particularly a catalyst, yes, sir. Or maybe that will be actually over tracking too much, if we call it that way. All right. Now, before we go into this detail, I want to discuss the mitochondria. The mitochondria, <coughs> there is a way in which most of my students like saying that the function of the mitochondria is. And I love hearing that because most students say the mitochondria is the what of the cell? Powerhouse. Exactly powerhouse of the cell and we are always quick to say the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell now if we ask the question why is it called the powerhouse of the cell yeah. suddenly the why part become interesting to answer right we know it is the powerhouse yes correct why is it the powerhouse so today i want to show you so that when you say the powerhouse, you do it with confidence because you know why it's the powerhouse of the cell. Right? So, you see, the mitochondria has a special structure. It has an outer mitochondrial membrane and an inner mitochondrial membrane. So this here is the outer mitochondrial membrane. This is the inner mitochondrial membrane. The space between them is the intermembrane space. Now, inside the mitochondria, you have a gel-like substance, which we refer to as the matrix. So briefly, the mitochondrial matrix is going to be rich in a lot of things. Some of the things that are going to be there would include protons, such as sodium, hydrogen, there will be potassium. There will be a lot of things. There will be enzymes, there will be coenzyme A, for example. There will be ADP. There will be so many enzymes, especially the enzymes that are involved in fatty acid oxidation, thin oxidation. They are actually in the mitochondrial matrix. It also contains other proteins and it contains its own DNA called the mitochondrial DNA. This DNA that it contains is particularly used for protein synthesis and these proteins that are actually going to be useful in the transportation of electrons in the mitochondria and in energy generation. Is that okay? So the mitochondrial matrix is actually rich in all those things. Now, this matrix in its gel form would contain a large amount of protons. And for today, I want us to focus on the protons that are actually contained <coughs> in the matrix. Because it is these protons that would be necessary for energy generation. So it would be the protons which will be there in large amounts. Okay? And then we also say there is ADP as well as phosphates. There. Okay? That's about the matrix. There is now what we call the inner mitochondrial membrane. 
This inner mitochondrial membrane is highly, highly selective. It is so selective, in fact, that it does not allow most substances to cross. Only some nonpolar substances can cross the inner mitochondrial membrane. For example, the short and medium chain fatty acids are likely to cross the inner mitochondrial membrane. The long chain fatty acids may not even cross. They would need assistance, for example, with help of things like carnitine, which we'll come to see as we start to discuss beta oxidation. So, for substances to go in and out of the mitochondrial matrix, they tend to use channels. And these channels we are going to discuss today would actually be referred to as complexes. There is what is called complex one, two, complex three, complex four, and there is also a complex five. These complexes work as the channels through which substances are able to cross, including the protons. The inner mitochondrial membrane has convolutions, which are actually referred to as cristae, and they increase the surface area for energy generation. So it looks something like this. Then, there is what is called the outer mitochondrial membrane. This outer mitochondrial membrane is selectively permeable, but not as selectively permeable as the inner mitochondrial membrane. So it can allow some substances to come in and get into the intermembrane space, but they may not go into the mitochondrial matrix, unless through the <coughs> complexes or specific transporter proteins. These are the properties of the mitochondria, and it's with these properties that you will come to see that energy will be generated. So just to delve in a little bit further, I must tell you that complex one works as a channel that is able to allow, that is able to allow the movement of protons from the matrix and into the membrane space. So it only allows them to go out. This is the same story with complex three and complex four. Wow, complex five allows protons to move from the intermembrane space into the matrix. This is something I want you to know. One, three, four allows protons to move from the matrix into the intermembrane space. Five allows protons to move from the intermembrane space and into the matrix. If this doesn't make sense, I can give you an example of, I love analogies. I love analogies because it becomes easier to understand things. But speaking of analogies, I once attended a clinical trials class. And in that class, where our, our, our lecturer was teaching, he's very good at clinical trials, he told us that he was going to explain to us one of the complicated form of statistics. It's called Bayesian statistics. So he said, guys, I have figured out how to explain Bayesian statistics to students because they fail to understand it. So me, I was excited. I was like, oh, okay. Bayesian statistics, I always want to know what it's all about. Then he said, here it is. He drew a graph. Then he said, you have a graph, and then you actually draw a line. Then what you do is that you carry out research and you start searching for this line. 
Now, the interesting thing is that he had made a video of this. So this thing was moving. And then he said, this is the best way of explaining Bayesian statistics. Guys, do now. Do now. I didn't figure it out. So I hope my analogies are not like his. So here is my analogy, guys. Let's try to think of the mitochondria as this classroom, right? The way this classroom is oriented. Guys, there is only certain places through which you can come out. You won't come out through the walls. Alright? That's what you want. And then let's think of ourselves as the hydrogen, the protons. Right? So you as protons cannot come out through any other means but through the door. Alright? And then further, I would like to explain how complex one works as a channel. We want to think of this as a door which opens outwards, which means this door being turned in another way, right? The other way, so that when you are here, you can easily push the door and it opens outside, right? Do you get the set? <coughs> what complex five is like the other door. When you're outside, you can easily push and get it. But when you're inside, you can't push and go out. Do you get the set? Mm -hmm. Guys, does this sound like the analogy of my... <laughs> it doesn't, right? Yes. Okay, so with this thinking, guys, I want us to go in and try to see how energy is going to be generated. Is that okay? Yeah. Alright. Now. So I made it clear that energy generation is actually going to happen from reduced equivalents, which would include NADH and FADH2. How would energy be generated from this? Well, at the end of the day, what is going to happen is this hydrogen and that hydrogen is going to be given onto oxygen and producing water. This is the simpler way of showing the equation. But let me show you how this happens in real time. And I'm going to start with a situation where you're dealing with enzymes that use NAD as their coenzyme. The enzymes that use NAD as their coenzyme are referred to as NAD linked dehydrogenases. From a discussion of enzymes, you know that enzymes would work with what we call coenzymes. And I should also tell you that it is on the coenzyme part of the enzyme that this reaction is going to occur. In fact, I should tell you that coenzymes are organic molecules, mainly vitamins. And we can easily give examples of how these vitamins work as coenzymes. Vitamin B1 works as a coenzyme in the form of thiamine pyrophosphate, and it's the coenzyme for the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, right? B2, riboflavine, would work as a coenzyme for lactate dehydrogenase. It will work as the coenzyme, particularly flavine adenine dinucleotide, okay? B3, niacin, would work as nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Did I say B2 for lactate dehydrogenase? It's mm -hmm. not. It's actually B2 for succinate dehydrogenase. In fact, I should tell you that there are not so many enzymes that use FAD as their coenzyme. It would be, it would actually be succinate dehydrogenase. It would also be fatty acyl CoA dehydrogenase. And yes, in the bridging reaction, you tend to use so pyruvate dehydrogenase complex and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex in the electron transport chain. They use uh, FAD as their coenzyme. Then there is NADH, which is used by enzymes such as lactate dehydrogenase, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, isocitrate dehydrogenase. All these, most of the coenzymes, if you are probably asked a question to say, You've seen a dehydrogenase and you're asked the question, what coenzyme do you think 
is going to wait for this dehydrogenase, you'll probably be correct if you guess anything.